So one of the things that we ended on was looking at this kind of do we care what the mechanism is. And so we're going to be constantly kind of cycling back through this and trying to address some of the reasons why we care about what the mechanism is because a lot of that is going to come down to our ability to predict which mechanism is important, which mechanism isn't. Uh, <clears throat> so from a chemical perspective, the chemical reactions that produce one product are always going to be more important to us because they only produce one product. And if we go through and look at these, it's not clearly labeled. But this is a one product reaction and so is this one. Those would be your SN2 and your E2. Those almost exclusively form one product. The SN1 and the E1 have a habit of producing multiple products, which means they're less consistent and less likely to be used. Okay? So it is going to be an important thing to identify. So how can we go through and identify those pieces? So as we're going through and looking at our reactions, what we'll be doing is evaluating these things that Cardi's built this table for us, at least initially, where he talks about looking at the factors that dictate what our mechanisms are, strength, concentration, leaving group, and solvent. I find some of those terms to be a little bit odd and some of them completely not useful. For instance, leaving group. So the intent behind this table is that we would go through and say, well, based on leaving group ability, I would say a substitution type 1 was valid. So I would put a check mark there. Right. Well, do I need a leaving group for an SN2? Yeah. Do I need one for an E1 and for an E2? Yeah. So the leaving group ability is a pretty useless factor to look at because... You need a leaving group, period. All of these reactions need leaving groups. Okay? So that row, I think, isn't particularly useful. The next part, concentration. Wow, is that really going to jiggle all of the class? That's irritating. Concentration. Okay? Where is concentration written in your chemical equation? It's not. So where do you find information about concentration? It could be given to you, or you're, or you're in the lab and you actually make it concentrated. No question is ever going to tell you concentration. So that's not particularly useful. Strength? Strength of what? Okay. It's kind of an arbitrary term, so it's not particularly useful. Okay. But the intent behind it is good. We're looking for certain factors, and what we would do is then match those factors up to the different mechanisms and put check marks if that mechanism needed that particular factor. So in this case, when we look at strength, said SN2 and E1 both favored something strong, right? which sounds weird, but whatever. Concentration, super important for the SN2, decided it wasn't important for the E2. Leaving group, right? well, they all need a leaving group, so I'm going to put check marks because our leaving group is present. And then solvent, right? favors the SN2. Okay? It's also possible for the E2. So now what do I do is I total up all my check marks within those columns. Notice for the SN2, I get four check marks. What does that mean happens? For the reaction I'm looking at, I should do an SN2 reaction. So it allows me to look at the starting materials and just say, what does this mean? What should I be drawing out? That's the intent behind the chart. Right? This is where if you actually download the slides, you'll probably see this table. It is a modified version of Cardi's table, uh, and in my opinion, a little bit more specific. So if we have a strong nucleophile, we could then go through and check mark if we had it or not. Notice that I have some NAs, as in not applicable. For an elimination, I don't want a nucleophile. That's why there's no N in that term. For bases, I don't want a base for substitution, because then I'd be doing acid-base stuff, not substitution. Okay, so I have NAs there. So the intent is to give you all of these factors that you need to be thinking about and then tying them to those mechanisms. Okay, well, what do each of those mechanisms require? That's where if we went back like four or five slides, there were those summary things. Those summary slides are effectively what you could fill into this and populate so that every time you solve a substitute or one of the reactions, you're thinking about this chart and what is the most check marks that come out of it. 
That allows you to decide what type of reaction you should be running, and in particular, what type of mechanism. Right? So as we move through, we'll keep referencing these individual pieces of those mechanisms and the mechanisms themselves so you can get an idea of what's happening within each of them. Right? Before we get too excited and looking at all those pieces, I figured we should double back kind of real quickly here. What does this look like to you guys? Does this look like OCHEM? No, what does this look like? 152. This is 152. Okay. This is literally off of the slides from when I taught 152. This is one of the slides I had. Looking at our reaction rates, so your rate is to equal to your rate constant times the concentration of your reactants and the orders of those reactants. Okay. And remember, those orders had to be proven experimentally. We had to go through and actually test and verify those through a sequence of calculations. Okay. What those orders were supposed to represent is a way to take the mathematics and turn that into kind of a concept in English, okay, or chemistry if you wanted to get out of the mathematics. So if you had a first order reaction, that reaction was not largely dependent on that species, but it was dependent on it. If it was second order, okay, well, the species that was second order is now super, super important to the mechanism. If it was zero order, well, now it was irrelevant to the overall reaction. So looking at our rate laws, we can get an understanding of what is happening at the chemical level. Right? So when I went through and talked about it, I'd look at the order of the reagent, 0, 1, 2, 3, and look at it as kind of an importance. 0, it has no effect on our reaction, so I don't care about it. 1, it's involved. 2, super involved. 3, it's all dependent on that reaction. We don't see four, five, or six because why is there no four, five, or six? Okay, remember, for a reaction to occur, these particles must all collide with each other at the exact same instant for the reaction to occur. To get four, five, or six particles to all collide at the exact same instant is not easy. Okay? It's relatively easy to have a single particle fall apart on its own. Okay? Not too bad to have two particles collide. Three particles colliding becomes difficult. So when we think about OCHEM, we take this a step further, and we pretty much ignore the three version. We're really only sitting with first order and second order reactions. It is super rare to see three things involved in a mechanism, and typically we don't do it because of how rare it is. Okay? So if you're drawing out a mechanism and you're like, well, three different things are interacting, you're doing it wrong. Okay? The names that get associated with these, you get the molecularity, non-existent, zero, no one ever talks about the zeros. Unimolecular, bimolecular being the most relevant. <coughs> Unimolecular meaning there's only one species involved in my rate or my order for my reaction. <coughs> bimolecular meaning there's two things involved in that rate. Right? So when we hear those terms pop up with our unimolecular elimination mechanisms, what we're saying is in that rate for that reaction, there's only one molecule. If I have a bimolecular substitution reaction, there's two things in that mechanism. Okay, so that's what those words mean and where they're coming from. That was a nice little jingle to go with that. Okay. If we look at our mechanisms, <clears throat> we can look at a sequence of chemical reactions and we might start to notice some patterns. Okay, one of those patterns being, there's a, a font type issue, and there's supposed to be some reaction arrows in there. Okay. We take a look for the rate for the first reaction. Okay, rate constant times ammonium times NO2 minus, right? Okay. Notice first order, first order, and the coefficients from the equation. One and one. That's kind of neat. We move to the next one. Rate is ClO2 squared, OH to the first. That didn't match. Okay. And in the last one, I don't even see CO at all. Okay. And that's again because the orders have to be solved from, from experimental evidence. Because okay. when we look at a reaction, there's a bunch of different stuff that could potentially be happening in that reaction. 
And so what we would have to do is break down the reaction into its individual simplest mechanistic steps, much like what we do with gen chem when we take a look at molecules. We break them down to their most individual simplest things, the atoms, and then we broke those down even further into our subatomic particles. We're doing the same thing with chemical reactions. We're breaking them down into their simplest form and then trying to draw conclusions about it. Okay. So why were those other two not matching the chemical reaction? It's really asking, why did the first one actually match? Well, the reason the first one actually matched is that that first one was not only an overall reaction, it was also the simplest mechanistic step. And because it was by definition a single mechanistic step, the order is equal to the coefficients. I was allowed to pull that information out directly from that information. Okay? That's kind of neat and useful in Gen Chem, because that meant you didn't have to deal with those giant massive tables of calculations, and you could just kind of jump straight through to writing down your rate laws. Okay? And I'm sure everybody loved writing down all those rate law things. Okay, so we could go through and do that in OCHEM. Let's skip that slide for the moment. We could take a look at this chemical reaction, and we could go through a sequence of trials where we varied the concentrations of each of the reactants, and we determined the rate, and we could go through and determine what the rate law was. All right? Everybody knows how to do that? Yes. Yes. And since everybody is going to say yes when I ask that question again, we won't have to talk about it again. Does everybody know how to do that? I do not remember how to do it. You want to say yes. <laughs> Everybody remembers how to do that. Yes. 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 For those people that don't remember how to do that, you can talk to me after class and I will be sure to add an extra question on your exam going through and evaluating the rate law <laughs> with the rate constants and all solving the orders. It's okay. Okay. That is not something that we need to go through and do. Okay. We'll leave that to 152. Okay. So what we're concerned about are just what are those mechanistic steps. Okay. Those simplest mechanistic steps are what's going to dictate our rate, okay, or in particular our rate law. And it's once we have the rate law, we can actually start to classify our reactions. So when we look at rate laws... If we think about, we actually already tried this one with brushing your teeth and all that stuff. The amount of time it takes us to do any individual thing, like getting to class. There's a bunch of stuff that has to happen in our process of getting to the class. You have to wake up. Maybe you shower. You probably put on clothes. Okay? Find your shoes. There's simple things that you could go through and do to simplify that. The night before, you put out your clothes, nice and neat, so you know exactly where they are. Okay? You know where your shoes are. Okay? You don't give your shoe to your dog because your dog may go bury it in the backyard. Okay? Simple things to kind of simplify that. Okay? To speed our process to getting, or slowing our process to get to class. You know, if I'm late enough, I just don't, won't come. Okay? <clears throat> Those kind of steps or processes are happening in chemical reactions also. Okay? And that's kind of what 152 was trying to address saying, look at this chemical reaction. There's a billion different things going on within this. How do we go through and make sense and logic and organization of all that information? In OCHEM, we just say somebody did all that, and here's our simple, organized, logical thought. Now we just want to manipulate those simple, logical thoughts into larger structures. So if I want to make a drug, penicillin, okay, I have to evaluate what pieces are in penicillin and then how can I get those pieces to connect? Well, how do those pieces connect? Why do they connect? Okay, what order should they be connecting in? Okay. All of those thought processes are what we've talked about up to this point in the semester. All of the pieces. We now have to put it all together. Okay. So, in our substitution, okay, in particular, our nucleophilic bimolecular reaction. So there's where all those symbols come from, S for substitution, N for nucleophilic, <coughs> and the two for bimolecular. And we talked about a substitution reaction. There were two things that happened. We broke the leaving group bond, and we made the carbon nucleophile bond, and we made them at the exact same instant. Because I was afraid it was going to do that, let's draw that out. 
So let's pick an example. We just pick a simple structure. We're talking about my leaving group. And now I have a nucleophile. That nucleophile has electrons. Those electrons need to be stabilized somehow. So they will come in and they will interact with the most positive atom in my other structure. Okay. The problem with that is we would then exceed the octet on that carbon. So we'd break our leaving group bond. The result being is we'd end up with a new bond to our nucleophile and we'd have our leaving group chilling off on its own. Okay. How do we know the leaving group left? Right. What would allow that leaving group to be good at leaving? An ability to exist on its own, which is useful. Right. What kind of things would be good to exist on their own? I would argue before we even look at size. Charge. Was the particle neutral when it left? Or is it going to carry a charge? Typically, it carries a charge when we're looking at these, but it doesn't have to. Right? There are leaving groups that would leave and leave as being uncharged particles. Those tend to be better at leaving. Why? They're more stable because charge is inherently unstable. And what if they are charged? What should I then evaluate to decide were they good at leaving? Size. How large were they? If they're large, they should be able to stabilize that extra pair of electrons. How about after size? Electronegativity. Okay. Did they pull the electrons away already from that carbon? What about after electronegativity? Resonance. Does the leaving group have resonance stabilizing that negative charge? How about after that? An inductive effect. Okay. Those same rules that we were using back with acids and bases are going <laughs> to come back and haunt us again here. Okay. We have to use those same rules. Okay. If you're not sick of hearing those rules, you should be very, very soon. Okay. Because you'll get sick of it, and then you'll start to realize that everything we do in OCHEM is looking at those same rules. Just apply them every single time. Okay. So we now have an idea about our leaving group. What about the nucleophile? What does the nucleophile have to do? What is it doing in this reaction? It's attacking the carbon. Okay. And... displacing the leaving group, meaning the nucleophile should be the complete opposite of the leaving group. So where the nucleophile might, or where the leaving group should be uncharged, what would we expect the nucleophile to be? Charged. It's trying to force out the leaving group. Okay. So in this reaction, I might expect that that nucleophile should actually be negatively charged. Okay. We're now talking about the strength of that nucleophile. Okay. The more strong it is, the more negative it is, the more likely it can displace that leaving group. Okay. What about the next rule? After charge, we have size. What do I want the size of that nucleophile to be? Typically, we want it to be small. Okay, and we run into weird exceptions, but as a general trend, small is usually better. Okay, and we'll encounter reasons why smaller is better. Okay, the first thing we can address on that reason, what is it reacting with? It is positively charged, but it's positively charged carbon. Where are the carbons found? They're in the structure. It's okay. Come on. Do better than that. <coughs> They're usually in the center of the structure. In the center of the structure behind a bunch of hydrogens. What charge do hydrogens typically hold? Positive. 
What charge was your nucleophile? Negative. Negative. The nucleophile needs to get into the center of our molecule to react with the middle atoms. They have to get by all the positive hydrogens on the outside. So our nucleophile should be as small as possible because if it's big, what does it encounter instead of the inside? Hydrogen. The hydrogen on the outside, in which case the nucleophile is no longer a nucleophile. It's What would it react with if it can't get to the inside? It would react with the outside, and what's on the outside? Hydrogen. hydrogen. So the nucleophile is now accepting hydrogens, which means it's not a nucleophile. It means it's a base. Right? So being aware of these definitions and how they interplay becomes really, really important. Right? So we just looked at two pieces, the leaving group and the nucleophile. Well, is there something else involved in this reaction? Solvent. There's actually something else written up there that we didn't even address. Okay. What did the nucleophile attack? The carbon. Was the carbon a leaving group? No. Was it the nucleophile? No. no. So there's another piece. That carbon is a new piece. That carbon we refer to as our substrate. Okay. It's the piece that's receiving those electrons. Well, could the substrate have an effect? Well, what's around that carbon right now? Those bonds, right? What are those bonds? Electrons. They will have to be present. Why? Did you say prison? No. They have to be present because they're present? No, I don't accept that. It's a good try, though. What? <laughs> Why do we need those bonds? If we don't have those bonds, does the carbon have its octet? No. So those bonds will always be present. So are those bonds going to dictate anything about the nucleophile attack? If they're always present, are they going to change anything? No, because they're always there. Right? What could change from those bonds? Okay, we could look at bond angle, okay? getting really nuanced. There's an easier answer than that. No. Easier than length. What is a bond? Define a bond. <laughs> Electrons, I don't accept. Electron sharing. Electron sharing with what? What, how many atoms? Two atoms. I've defined one of them. What have we not defined yet? The other atom. If I make that a carbon, is that going to be intrinsically different? I don't know why I said intrinsically, but it sounded cool. <laughs> then hydrogen. Yeah. Why would they be different? Because one's a C and one's an H. They're literally different symbols. Okay. How does that different symbol mean anything to us? What does an H mean? Hydrogen. Not one proton. In OCHEM, what are we concerned about moving? Electrons. Electrons. So when you see H, you're not thinking protons or <coughs> neutrons. What you should be thinking? One electron. And when you see C, you should be thinking? <laughs> shared is C? How does that even make sense? I don't understand. Don't bring coordinate into this. <laughs> that's just going to be that's going to be dangerous. When you see C, what should you think? Uh, coordinate and covalent, both of you want to see. That's true. <coughs> what did we just say H meant? One. One electron. When we see C, what should we see? Four, Four electrons. Are the electrons going to dictate whether or not that nucleophile can get into a react? Yes. Yeah. More carbons means. More electrons, which means less possibility for the nucleophile to attack. Right? More electrons doesn't sound sciencey enough, so we invented a term. 
sterics. Sterics is just a way of referencing the electron bulk. Right? So if you have steric hindrance, what are we saying? There's a bunch of electrons hindering or preventing that thing from happening. That's all it means. Right? So what does this mean for a substrate? Do I want Cs? No, I want Hs. Okay. And if I went through and did that, could I now name that halide? Or that leaving group structure, that substrate? So I don't know the leaving group. Name the other piece. Methyl. Classify that other piece. It is not <laughs> primary. Oh, somebody said it. It would be zero area because there's no other carbons connected. So coming up with those classifications, for this reaction, a zero area carbon or a zero area substrate makes a lot of sense because the nucleophile can then get in. What would not make a lot of sense? If I change those hydrogens to be carbons, <coughs> they would now prevent the reaction and the nucleophile can attack. How do I know they prevent the reaction? What do you mean the reaction doesn't occur this way? Um, if you were to run this reaction, you would see that you have an intermediate step. If we went into the lab and tested this, with these conditions for SN2, doesn't happen. This is literally a lab discovery. We can go through outside of lab like we just did and say we would expect the tertiary to not react as fast as the zero area. But does that mean the tertiary doesn't react? We don't have that clairvoyance to be able to make that statement. It's only when we go into lab and test it do we see tertiary doesn't happen. Right? No, you aren't that good. So the tertiary is not expected to happen here. So we've looked at the substrate. Just by drawing out the mechanism, we can now predict that the substrate should be small, less sterically hindered. The leaving group should be stable on its own. That was kind of mind-numbingly obvious. Nucleophile should be charged because it's trying to force the leaving group off. Right? So we've addressed three of our primary categories for this. What was the last one that was mentioned earlier? Yep. The solvent. The solvent is going to be added to help get these two things to mix with each other. The nucleophile is negatively charged. Our substrate is neutral. It has a partial positive charge, but it's neutral. Would I expect an ionic substance to mix with a nonpolar or a London dispersion substance? No. So I need something to be act as a happy intermediary to get those two to mix. Right? So a nonpolar solvent isn't going to work because i got to get the nu nucleophile to dissolve. I could do something super polar like a protic solvent. Right? What is that protic solvent going to supply? Jim, Merry Christmas. An insanely large partial positive. What would that insanely large partial positive interact with? probably the formal negative charge. What happens to the negative charge? It becomes neutral. What did I say was important? That it's, not. that it's not neutral, that it's charged. So a protic solvent kills the nucleophile. That's not good, so I don't want that. Okay? So I can't go protic, I can't go nonpolar. That leaves me only with polar aprotic. That still allows me the ability to dissolve the ionic compound but then not so much that it kills the ionic compound. Okay? All of those pieces fit together in an interlock. Okay? If we look at it all together, nice and pretty now, the nucleophile can come in and attack. <sighs> Dang it. Thinking about the summer, apparently. <laughs> if we look at our reaction, it all happens in one step. Okay, so if we looked at an energy diagram, we'd start with a reactant 
our product should be lower in energy. That would be our energy diagram, single step. What happens is I change the substrate, okay, or the leaving group ability, or the strength of the <coughs> nucleophile. Well, that means every single one of those positions now has an option to change. If the leaving group becomes less good, what happens? Less good is grammatically correct, isn't it? <laughs> really? Less good isn't grammatically correct? No. I don't know about that. <coughs> Not as good? <laughs> okay, what happens? The leaving group is our product. If our product becomes less, <laughs> not as good, it's a horrible, man. Our product energy goes up, which means less likely to happen. Okay. What happens if my nucleophile becomes less negative? Less likely to happen, good. What a part of this is less likely to happen? How does the energy diagram change if the nucleophile becomes less negative? The reactant side, the nucleophile is on the reactant side. What would happen to the reactant energy? It goes higher. What would happen to the transition state energy? Right. So if it affected the reactant and increased the energy of the reactants, our reaction should go faster. Well, we just said that shouldn't happen. So what happens to the energy of the reactants? Those go down. What happens to your energy when you become more stable? You go down. The more stable you become, the lower energy you are. Okay. Think about all those times where people would say, you are unstable. You weren't just sitting there like, ah, oh, yeah. And I'm like, oh, put the knife down. Right? That, that wasn't just you sitting there with a knife. Well, that could be kind of creepy too, actually. So <laughs> let's just avoid that. The reactive energy drops. Right? So what we're trying to do is evaluate how these things change. What happens if the substrate changes? Right? So right now, our substrate, how would you classify that? So there's our carbon where the reaction's happening. How many carbons are connected to it? One, One carbon, so it's primary. Okay. So just for the sake of color coding, let's go through and say this is my primary curve now. What happens if I add two carbons? It's secondary. I added two carbons, so it would be oh. tertiary. How does this affect my reaction? Well, so is it changing my reactant energy? They're both neutral. Is it changing the product? No, they're all neutral. What's changing? It's the transition state. When that nucleophile comes in, it's getting closer to more electrons. Those electrons now repel it away, which means the transition state becomes higher. So now when I go through and look at this, which of these two would I predict to react faster? The primary or the tertiary? Primary, because it has a lower activation barrier. Okay. So using that information and plotting it into a graph can help us interpret what's going on. Kind of, sort of? Okay. Question. So quantifying the energy of any of these stages, yes, you're looking at the energy within those bonds. Okay? We do not, or rather I do not, want to quantify it. And then by corollary, I'm going to guess you don't want to, qu to quantify them. Okay? If you wanted to quantify them, you could go through and quantify for the reactant and product. Doing everybody's favorite from 151. Hess's law stuff. 
determining the energy of an individual species by adding up the enthalpy of formation of each of the, yeah. Okay? So you could go through and do it and verify where these things are. Where you're going to run into problems is how would you dictate the energy of the transition state. Because the transition state does not exist, there's no energy to calculate. Right? So really what we're doing is predicting the energy of that peak based off of everybody's favorite, Arrhenius's law. Who knows that? Nobody knows that? Uh, so I, can I just make it up? You do know. Yeah, we had to calculate it. Yeah, you could go through and do all that. I don't want to do it either. I don't remember. Right? So we could go through and quantify all of that. And that is why they talk about it in Gen Chem. That is why you're supposed to do Gen Chem ahead of OCHEM. Because you now have the fundamentals to explain this. Unfortunately, what we've done is kind of the opposite. We didn't give you the fundamentals. We gave you all the quantification. You had no idea what it meant. This is what it meant. Right? This is what you were trying to do with all of those calculations, was predict energy diagrams like this so that you could go through and quantify and say this. Right? Again, we could go through and do all those experiments to quantify these. But how did I just draw this diagram? By guessing, I know electrons repel each other, so this is where those electrons are going to repel. That's going to cause this to go up, this to go down, this to go sideways, and everything matches out. I may not have quantified it, but my experimental observation of just looking at the pieces gets me so close that I am predictively within the 95% confidence range. Why do the calculations? Okay. Why? Because some physical chemist wants to do it and give it to them. Okay. If we look at our rate law, our rate law is always dependent on our slow step. There's only one step. So by definition, that is our slow step, which means rate will be equal to our rate constant times the concentration of reactants that are involved in it. Because this is a single mechanistic step, the orders directly translate out of it. How many species are involved in that single step? Two. I have the nucleophile and I have my substrate. So when I look at my rate law, there it is. Okay. The rate for this reaction would have what order? Second order, one plus one. The order for each reactant would be one. The reaction itself would be second order also known as bimolecular, which is that giant freaking title at the top. Okay. That bimolecular has to do with the rate and with nothing else. Okay. Just because it's a fun question to mess with people's heads on, what do those brackets mean? Concentration. concentration. How do you calculate concentration? I was like, well, you can't calculate that. Yeah, you can. Come on, it's not that bad. The moles of our nucleophile, okay, divided by liters of our solution. Solution's too vague, so let's switch it up to solvent. Why does this become important? What happens when I double the solvent for this reaction? What happens to the rate? It decreases. Why would it decrease? If I double my solvent, my concentration halves. What happens to my rate? What happened to my substrate concentration? It also halved. So it's a have and a have. We have the have not. Sorry, four. Okay. So we can see solvent effects directly affect our rate, even though they aren't explicitly in our rate law. They're in our concentrations, and they can mess with our mind when we go through and deal with those. So watch out for those. Right? The big key word that you should remember with your SN2 is the one in quotes at the bottom, backside attack. The nucleophile has to come in from the backside, right? where that leaving group is leaving. Multiple explanations on why, right? but the easiest one is what is the leaving group leaving with? Electrons. Electrons. If the nucleophile tried to come in and attack from the same side as the leaving group, what does it encounter? Electrons. And you would get electron-electron repulsion. No reaction happens. 
So it has to come in from the complete opposite side. For those of you that want to know about it, the official argument has nothing to do with this hand wavy electron repulsion thing. It has to do with the hand wavy argument of anti bonding orbitals in molecular orbital theory. Oh. Seriously? Yes. And it is awesome. If you would like to learn about that, you can talk to me after class or in lab, and I'll show what's going on with that. It's a bit crazy, but that's what's happening. That's why we have backside attack. Okay? It is due to molecular orbital theory. You don't want to deal with molecular orbital theory? Electrons don't like each other. Go the other way. Okay? What happens in SN1? Well, now we go through it stepwise. Should I draw it out stepwise? Should we just jump to the answer? Jump to the answer. There's our answer. We look at our overall reaction. What do you notice is some things that are different from the last one? Two steps? This one's showing three steps. Okay. That may look a bit odd, so we'll address that in a second, too. Okay. So we have more steps. The reason, one of the, one of the reasons why I bring in the, the extra step here is because everybody goes, well, SN1 is one step because it's one. No. The one and the two have nothing to do with the number of steps, but it's very easy to start trying to match them to that. They have nothing to do with the number of steps. Okay, so ignore that aspect to it. Okay? So we have more steps in the SN1. It, to do the official substitution part of the reaction, there are only two steps. I have to break a bond, then form a bond. Okay? But that does not mean I will necessarily end at a stable structure. Because if we just do those first two steps, where would I end? In that lower right-hand corner, is that structure stable? No, it has a charge. So because of that, the reaction continues on. Okay? It is typically charged because it has an extra hydrogen bound to it. So what do we have to do? Break the hydrogen off, which means acid base step. All right? What other things do you notice? No subtle hints and now everybody's distracted by trying to figure out the music and check out Mike dancing. <clears throat> if you were watching the slides, good for you. Everybody else saw probably more than they wanted to. <clears throat> Hydrogen bound to the nucleophile. Why is that different than the previous one? It's bound to something. It's bound to something in such a state that what happened to the nucleophile? It's no longer charged. Okay. Is that going to be important in this? Well, maybe. It's going to come down to our rate law. What might our rate law be for this? Well, with three steps, we've got a lot more work to figure this out. What happens in the first step? You break the leaving group. We start neutral and we end? Charged. Is that going to be an easy thing to do? No, that's hard. How about charged to? Charged. What do you think? Easy or hard? Easier. Good description there. Okay, way to add into that. That should be easier than the first step, because the first step okay, was going fully charged. Now we're just shifting charge. Last step, charge to neutral. What do you think? Easy. So if we go through and look at this, we had easiest, easier, and ugh. Which step is my rate limiting step? The first step. So if I was to write out a rate for this reaction, it would be rate equals K times concentration of my reactants. How many reactants are in that first step? Just one. Which means first order reaction, unimolecular. That's where the SN1 comes from. Do I care about the nucleophile? Look at that rate law. Where does it say nucleophile? 
Oh, it doesn't. Do I need a strong nucleophile? No. no. Why not? It has nothing to do with the slowest step of the mechanism, which is why when I look at the nucleophile in the, under these conditions, we're now showing it as neutral. Okay, we're evaluating each of those pieces and notice that it becomes less important. Okay. What else do we notice is something interesting coming out of this? We form a carbocation. Based on molecular orbital theory, I know, but this one you got to answer. Where is the carbocation? In a p orbital. Why is that relevant? Where can the nucleophile dump its electrons? Into the top lobe of the p orbital or the bottom lobe, which means there's two possible orientations for the nucleophile. It could either be kind of wedged coming up at us or dashed going away. Could that be an important thing for my solve? Quite likely. Okay. So in that slow step, the first thing that happened is we formed a carbocation. Okay. So what's going to help that step happen faster? So if we looked at our energy diagram... We're starting with our reactant, and then we go to a carbocation. Where should the carbocation be, higher or lower? Higher. What's going to ha help that step happen faster? If that cation is more stable, what happens? The activation barrier drops because it's an endothermic reaction. Again, fancy words, Hammond postulate. Okay. Our transition state is closest in energy to the species closer to it. In this case, our product. Right. How could I make this cation more stable? It could have extra electrons. Okay. So instead of being a primary carbocation is drawn, drawn, it could be. It could move up to being a tertiary carbocation because there's now more carbons around that positive charge to stabilize it. So we might predict the tertiary to react faster than the primary, which might already scream as something kind of weird happening. Why would that be weird? In the SN2, which one reacted faster? The primary. We are now getting the opposite <laughs> result. And we looked at the SN2, and we said the primary reacted faster because its transition state had a lower energy. Okay. Uh, and we said our nucleophile, sorry, I wanted to go with nucleophile. The nucleophile allowed the reaction to go faster when it was strong, meant it had higher energy. What's happening here? This reaction goes faster when? Lower at weight. That doesn't make any sense. A reaction goes faster if I have lower energy? When I think about a reaction, what am I looking at? Reactant to product. When I think about a reaction, I'm rarely looking at any kind of intermediate. And in the SN2, what happened? There was no intermediate to evaluate. So I'm only changing the energy of the reactants and the products. Here, what's happening? I'm looking at the intermediates. So when I think about what reaction happens faster, I have to get beyond the cation and get towards the product. Okay? So even if my product is the same energy for both of those reactions, the tertiary will happen faster because it has a lower activation barrier in the very first step. The intermediate is going to change now how we think about our reactions. Okay? So we have to be careful to make sure we know where we're placing things. Higher energy does make things react faster. Okay? Lower energy can make things react faster as well, as long as it's not a reactant. It's a product. Okay? 
So we can again break or continue to break down each of the pieces behind this, but I kind of want to advance on into our energy diagrams and take a look at some of these in a little bit more depth. Okay, remember what our basic components are behind these. If you're trying to find the slides, it's not there. I wanted to make sure we got back to energy diagrams. Okay, so if we take a look at an energy diagram for our SN2. So reaction, here's whoops, our energy. And if we looked at an SN2, we've got our reactants, then we have our products. Okay. And we could vary the reactant and product energies okay, by changing the nucleophile or leaving group abilities. Okay. But the big one that we want to focus on is our substrate. And if we go through and change our substrate and make this more primary, we see a drop in the energy, right? Okay. That transition state changes. Okay. And the transition state is a tricky one to evaluate because it doesn't exist. That's a hard structure to think about. Okay. What happens if we move to now SN1? We have an intermediate popping up in this. Ooh, that was supposed to be an I. So let's just assume that we still get the same energy product. Okay. Let's go ahead and call that one tertiary. Okay. What happens if we go through and do it with a primary? Well, the primary is now higher in energy. Okay. And so now when we think about our reactions, what we need to be thinking about is what are the things that affect each of those. The tertiary in our SN1 is more stable than the primary which drops the activation barrier for the intermediate formation. Okay. Which reaction might you expect to happen faster? The primary SN1 or the tertiary SN1? Tertiary. tertiary. Which step would you expect to happen faster of that? In purple. The intermediate to product, primary or tertiary? From the intermediate. I would bet most people would say the primary. Why would you say the primary? If I want to speed up a reaction, which of these reactions is going to happen faster? Why is the top one going to happen faster? Less activation energy. That's likely what we're thinking about when we think about primary and tertiary substrates for SN1, is we're thinking back to this energy diagram. Okay. The issue is that I have to make that carbocation. So when we think about SN1 reactions, we say the tertiary reacts the fastest. Okay. It's probably going to be a slower second step. Do I care about the second step? No. Does the first step happen for the primary? For the primary. Do I make the primary carbocation? No. So I don't care what happens in the second step. It's really an irrelevant conversation because it doesn't happen for both. It can only happen for the formation of the tertiary. Kinda? When we move directly to the SN2, that one's a little bit easier to process because it's a single diagram. It's a single step. Kind of makes sense? So when you think about your reactions, think about the energetics behind them and how they dictate what we end up with at different stages. Okay? What we're looking at is ultimately a derivation of what we're talking about and saying. If you don't want to derive it, that's great for a multiple choice answer. Memorize those things that we talked about. Memorize the correct answer and you're fine. Okay. The issue is when your memory fails you, you need something to rely back on. That's where the energy diagram can come in handy. Okay. So repercussions of these mechanisms. Substitution, 
type 1 versus type 2. What products do we expect? Well, what happens in the SN1? Or let's switch it up. Which do you want to look at first, SN1 or SN2? SN1. Okay, so let's start with the 1. What's the first step in the 1? Leaving group leaves. The result is I have that ring. Trust me, it's a ring. And I'd have that carbocation. Okay, I might even have copied it out as this. Is that valid? Uh, not really. Why not really? What is the hybridization of that carbon? SP2, what is the geometry of that carbon? Trigonal planar. Is there any reason to show wedges and dashes? No. So you shouldn't be showing any wedges and dashes. Okay, simplify it. Where's the carbocation? Yes, it's on a tertiary position, fair enough. Where's the positive charge held? Yes, it's on the carbon. Where on the carbon? In the p orbital. Where is that p orbital? Okay. Because we've drawn the bonds all in the plane of the paper, the p orbital must be perpendicular to it. It's coming in and out of the plane at you. Okay. Why does that then become tricky for us? Well, what happens in the next step? The iodide needs to come in and bond. Where is it going to place those electrons? It could place them in the top of the p orbital or the bottom. If it comes in from the top, not to give away any hints here, what would our structure look like? That was a joke for those of you wondering about not to give away any hints. If it came, from, came in from the top, what would we have? A wedged iodide. What would we have behind it? That methyl is now forced to go backwards. It has to go back. What if it attacks from the bottom? Now we'd be dashed, and our methyl would be wedged. So cool, we addressed the two possible attacks that could have come out of it. Did I have to do that? Okay. Why do I have to do that? Are those two products identical? No. So do I have to identify it? Yes, because I'm getting two different structures. I have to show it. Okay. What if I went through and did it and I didn't draw two different structures? Uh, no, literally, there were no, when I did both attacks, top and bottom, and I drew those structures, and there was no difference between them. Then they're the same thing. What do I need to draw? Just one. I don't have to draw the other because it's identical. In this case, they aren't identical. I have to show both. Okay. What happened with the SN2? Well, the iodide attacked, the chlorine leaves. Okay. So the chlorines or the iodides coming in from the back side of that chlorine, which means what should the bond look like? What is behind, how would I draw behind the chlorine? Dashed. Why dashed and not wedged? Because the chlorine was wedged coming at you. Okay? Because if the chlorine was dashed, what's behind the chlorine? Then it would be wedged. Okay? You're trying to tie it back to the frame of reference of how your drawing was established. Okay? So the back side of that chlorine is now dashed for the iodine. Where's that methyl group? It can't be dashed at the same time because the iodide is now there, which means that methyl group got pushed forwards and it is now wedged. 
What other product was produced in the SN2? There's only that one attack. That's all I get. So if I run with the exact same starting materials, there is no difference between these. SN2, I get one product. With SN1, I get two. That's a pretty huge difference. Right? Particularly if we're looking at a synthetic drug that we want to give to somebody. One case, half of your yield is now wrong and potentially toxic. Right? So we need to take this into consideration when we go through and run reactions. Be aware of where those things are attacking because that changes the products that come out of this. Right? So the way I define this is a complication of each of these mechanisms. The complication of the SN2 is I get only one product. Well, that's not a complication. I only get one thing. That's good. What happened to the stereo center? Right. For those of you dealing with R and S really quickly, our starting material was S. Our product ends up being R. And if you don't believe me, test it. You'll see that that is true. Right. What's the problem with that? I inverted my stereo center. So the complication in an SN2 mechanism results in inversion of a stereo center. The next question that sometimes come up, comes up is, is that always? <sighs> always when it matters. Uh, it's not always. A lot of it d depends on the substituents also located there. I would say probably 90% of the cases that you see, inversion is true. Okay. Of the remaining 10% for SN2, <laughs> Probably 9% of those, there wasn't a stereo center to begin with, okay, or it wasn't even being asked about. And then that last 1%, you don't get inversion of stereochemistry. And that's not because you didn't get backside attack. That's because the new substituent did not replace the leaving group in the order of priority. Because remember, R and S are dictated based off of priority of each of those groups. If your new substituent's priority is lower than where it started, you're not going to get an inversion, sort of. Okay, you don't get an inversion of stereochemistry. You get an inversion, just not of stereochemistry. Okay? Insanely rare, but it does pop up every so often. Okay? Uh, SN1, what's our complication? We get two products. If we think back to the complication slide, because I know you all memorized exactly everything I said. Again, sarcasm. I don't expect that. What is the relationship between those two structures? They're enantiomers. They're mirror images of each other. There's only one stereo center, so they can't be diastereomers. One is R and one is S. Well, how much of each did I produce? Well, did that attacking nucleophile have a preference for one lobe of the p orbital than the other? No. There's nothing about the structure that prevents one attack from the other, which means both are equally valid, which means I get a 50% mixture of these. Okay. The complication is now loss of stereochemistry, with loss in quotes. Is there a stereocenter in both of those product, products? Yes, so did I lose stereochemistry? No. But if I evaluate the optical activity of the product, is that you stabbing a knife in my eye? Is that what that was? Goose egg. Goose egg, okay. If we evaluate the optical activity, what happened to the optical activity? Well, we started with an enantiomerically pure substance, so we had optical activity. When we end the SN1, what happens? We have zero optical activity. So we could use optical activity to test different mechanisms. Right? And SN1 is going to result in the loss of optical activity. And SN2 will keep it, but it will change the magnitude of that optical activity. Right? This is why we talked about opt optical activity and chirality. Right? I think I said it all about stacking, right? So visualizations, 
the intermediate here is a carbocation with what hybridization? SP2. That remaining p orbital is where the carbocation is sitting. Okay. So what we can do is change our view on the molecule to help us see this, is if we take this molecule and instead of having it be in the plane of the paper, I rotate it up and out. So it's now coming in and out of the plane at you. Okay. Ah. Cardi, of course, has to rotate it on a different axis that is harder to see, for me at least. So instead of taking it as I just did with my hands like this, how did Cardi do it? Ah. Okay. <laughs> Which is fine, they're showing the same thing. Okay. The intent being is we now see the positive charge. Where's our p orbital? The p orbital is here and here. It's now to the side, left and right as opposed to top and bottom. Okay. What does that mean? The iodide can dump its electrons into either lobe of that p orbital, generating either product. Just for the record, my rotation was better because then you have top and bottom, mm -hmm. like the wedges and dashes. Just... Fine. Everybody see it? No. no? Which part? No. Which, the rotation of it out? Yeah, of course. Okay, fine. That way. So, we're going to take the structure. I'm going to abbreviate the ring as pH. Are you okay with that? Yep, so that is now in the plane of the paper. So I've done a little tick to just rotate it flat, and now I'm just going to spin. Okay, so when I did that rotation, this ethyl group on the left-hand side is now where? Coming out at you, right? So that needs to be shown as a wedge. There's the ethyl or ET because ethyl begins with ET. Okay. What's the other one? The methyl? Because as I did that rotation, it's now my index finger. It's now where? Away from you. So that would be our dashed. And methyl begins with ME. Me. Okay. It's still a carbocation. That carbocation is located in a p orbital. That p orbital is above and below the plane. Your iodide can either dump its electrons into the top, in which case, if I did the reverse back out, the iodide would be Okay. So we've got it straight up. Okay. I do the reverse back out. The iodide is now wedged. What if I did the connection to the bottom? It would now be iodide dashed. Does that help visualize? Yes. yes. See, my way was better. Well... The rest of you got it on the first one, so I guess the majority says I was wrong. So. We good? Okay. Another big complication of our SN1. In that intermediate, what did we form? A carbocation. Are carbocations stable? No. What do carbocations immediately try and do? Stabilize. Right. So we've got this order of our carbocations, with the tertiary being more stable than the secondary, more stable than the primary, and more stable than the zero area. When we look at our carbocations, more than likely, we can ignore the zero, zero area and primary. Right. But something those of you in the lab can help us out with is what is more stable than tertiary? Resonance. And for those of you wondering, well, how does resonance change this? If I take a look at a tertiary carbocation, ta-da, tertiary. Right. That was magical. I don't know why you didn't clap. Versus a primary. Just seeing if you'd clap. Right. Primary carbocation, tertiary carbocation, which is more stable? 
tertiary. But what do we have over here? We have resonance. Okay. What I'm comparing is now the charge on that carbon versus the charge on that carbon. So on the tertiary structure, what is the charge? One. Plus one. On the primary with resonance structure, what is the charge? Plus a half. I have that charge spread across multiple atoms, which means when I go through and interpret, was that just a mother F? Yeah. Okay, just checking. Okay. The charge is now spread across multiple atoms, which means the effective charge on that carbon is now plus a half. Is a plus a half more stable than a plus one? Yep. What does that mean? Resonance trumps just our substitution effects. Right? So a primary plus resonance is more stable than a tertiary. Is there something more stable than a primary? A secondary with resonance is more stable. A tertiary with resonance is more stable. Okay. So we have to consider that resonance effect when we think about our stabilities. Okay. The next kind of fun part that comes into this is what happens if a secondary carbocation is near a tertiary carbocation. So let's look at a structure. Oh, of course, there's the answer. That was fun. Let's pretend we didn't see that. So here's my secondary carbocation. And over here, I have a tertiary position. Okay. Or technically, that's quaternary. So let's, let's drop that down. Actually, let's make that a hydrogen. Okay. And that is now a tertiary carbon. The secondary carbocation is not the most stable carbocation. Okay. So if it can, it will try to stabilize. And it can stabilize by reacting with a nucleophile. Okay. That's fair game. But that nucleophile must impact it. So that means we're waiting for something to happen. Meanwhile, while we're waiting for something to happen, what could we be doing? We could be trying to fix it ourselves. Okay. You get a headache. You could go to the doctor to wait for them to give you pills to fix your headache. Or you try and fix it yourself. That doctor will help probably. Okay. But you could do it yourself. What happens with the structure? Well, while it's piddling around, it just says, well, what happens if I take the electrons from that hydrogen and I just move it over here? Well, that's way too far. Remember, tetrahedral structure, that bond is just as far away as every other bond in blue. They're all equidistant. Don't believe me? There's this thing that I told you that you should be using frequently. I believe it was called a model kit. You should pull that out and test that and verify that, yes, indeed, I'm right. That sounded a little bit more kind of condescending than I wanted. I apologize. <laughs> What happened? That hydrogen is now over here. I promise I didn't want it to come out of that condescending. It needed to be a little condescending. Okay. What happened to our secondary carbon? Our secondary carbon is no longer positively charged. It is more stable. Right. What happened to the tertiary position? That tertiary position is now missing electrons. It is positively charged. I now have a tertiary carbocation as opposed to a secondary. Why would the molecule do this stupid curly Q thing to do this? Tertiary is more stable than secondary. That's why. Okay? That's why it'll initiate the rearrangement. It's because it'll move to something that is more stable. It is something that will plague any carbocation mechanism. If you see a carbocation, you should immediately try and do rearrangements okay, or resonance, something to stabilize the carbocation before you do anything else. Look inside the structure. Okay. So let's do a quick modification because we're almost out of time. For those of you saying we are out of time, 
I still said almost. Still secondary carbocation, yes? Can I make it to the tertiary position? No. I could potentially take this hydrogen and do that shift. What would the result be? A secondary carbocation. Well, now there, couldn't I go through and do the tertiary? Yes. Yes, you could. Problem with that, why did you do the first step? Did you lower the energy in that first shift? No. So does the first shift happen? No. I don't care that if I continue going, I can make something more stable. If I don't have a valid first step, the subsequent steps are irrelevant. It has to go to a more stable position. Has to. Right? What can you rearrange? Anything. And with that, we're done.